Hello, uh, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Andy Saylor, uh, Kilo Fox 7, Victor Oscar Lima, up here in uh, Linden, uh, Whatcom County, and uh, happy to be here uh, presenting to you guys uh, and sharing our Whatcom County uh, digital radio. Uh, before we dive into this, I want to uh, introduce the other people I have with me here today, uh, and Bud, let's send it over to you. Yeah, Andy, thanks. This is Bud, WB7FHC, and hopefully you just saw a video of me talking about the boards that we're going to see Andy put on today. So uh, hopefully you already know who I am. How about uh, over to Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Magnuson, AG7GN from Bellingham, and uh, I work with both Bud and uh, Andy on their various projects and I'm, uh, I'm the guy responsible for the HamPi image that's been uh, used or is being used on the Nexus DRX board. Off to uh, Peter next. I'm Peter Dahl. Um, I'm Peter Dahl, WA7SUS. Uh, I'm, uh, I live in Briar and I'm a long, long time friend of Bud's. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're really thankful to have this opportunity to share with you a little bit about what we're doing up here in Whatcom County using using Bud's uh, a product that he produces, the DRX board, uh, working with Steve uh, on, on the image and then taking all those components, um, being able to put them together and help uh, be able to service the community. Um, so that's really important to us and we've had some, uh, what I feel is some good success for that. So we wanna share that with you today. All right, so what we've done today is we've thrown together a, a picture kind of slide deck uh, that kind of walks you through um, our deployment through our different sites. Um, there are many different deployments in the county, uh, but the ones that we're gonna share with you today are primary deployments that uh, um, have to do with their, the remote access only. Um, they play very key roles, so we're gonna walk through them. Uh, so this is the Whatcom County Digital Radio, and then what's important to understand about these um, is these are all unmanned stations. Um, so from anywhere in our county, uh, any of our ham radio operators, uh, whether it be myself, uh, Steve Magison, um, Bud, if, if he chose to, or other MCOM uh, personnel, they can uh, remotely access these machines through conventional internet, uh, public internet, or through HamWAN or other uh, uh, HAM uh, access methods. So if we take a look at Whatcom County today, um, what we'll find is, is we already had a, a fairly good uh, MCOM WinLink presence, and that's what this uh, image uh, depicts or represents. Uh, what we did from that point is we took the stations that were already uh, in the county, we looked for pockets and blind spots, and uh, we understood where they were, and we tried to figure out ways to use these machines, these boards, and these remote radio stations to backfill those blind spots. Um, so in today's environment, we have W7BPD, that's our Blaine uh, ACS, they're up there, and that I'm aware of. Um, that one is run by their group, but they, and Bud, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they are not using one of their boards, as, your boards as well? They have one of our boards at this time, but they're waiting for an opportunity to get up to the site and implement it. So they have the board, but they're not using it at this time. Yeah, yeah, okay, absolutely. So there's, uh, that's one of the stations, and that station's going to play a very key role in our, our Northwest County. Uh, the station just to the right of that is the KF7 VOL, that's my home personal station. Um, that is using uh, one of Bud's uh, DRX boards in a Raspberry Pi configuration. Uh, I can remote access into that machine as well, uh, but currently it's uh, pretty easy for me because it's also just in the closet, so that works out. KC, uh, KC7 OAS is an existing station. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, deployment is on that one, uh, but I know it is very strong and it works well. W7 ECG. Um, is one of our older applications. It, it doesn't use it isn't using the DRX uh, set up today, uh, but down the road we absolutely have the opportunity to upgrade it, but it plays a very key role, ECG. Uh, we got KB7 TEC, we're going to talk about that one. That's our Bellingham Technical College, and that is using the DRX in one of our remote sites, uh, so that's one of the ones that uh, we do not have personnel at, so we, we access that one remotely. Uh, W7RE is a very, very strong um, a Mount Baker Highway machine. It's up in the Kendall area. Um, and that services all the way down through uh, Van Zant um, into Deming and up towards uh, the Glacier area. So that's a very key machine. Uh, we have the NG2G. This machine was actually just recently updated uh, to a DRX board and the HamPi image. So we were really excited to do that. And the K7SFV. Um, this one is just down here in Acme and that's one I will share with you guys as well. 
Um, this is the Acme fire station. So what we found is we saw that there was a big blind spot down that I-90 corridor, and we wanted to make sure that we could be able to service our users down there. So that's a little bit about what the WinLink network looks like um, and how these DRX boards can play into that. So we'll kind of expand as we go here. So once, once you get the DRX board from Bud, and Bud's already talked about that, um, he does a really good job of packaging it. Um, you get the board, you get all the components. You can see there on the right-hand side, you get his uh, well-built instructions. Um, next steps, build time. Um, I, I think the real success story here is, is I come from having zero background uh, with circuit board uh, work, building, um, any, anything that kind of falls into that vein. And, and I found this to be a very, very quality build. Um, it was easy for me to kind of get on board, uh, evaluate his instructions, look at the pieces and the parts and components, uh, and to be able to build one successfully the first time. So he does a really great job. And this is what it looks like for me um, when I end up putting one of the boards together. Uh, anything you want to share about this? I know you talked about your board, Bud, but. Well, no, other than the fact that we've, uh, we've had several build parties and I've watched people put these together and I appreciate when people have trouble uh, getting at a particular com component. Maybe they're trying to solder something in and another piece is in the way. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about the order in which you put the parts in. And uh, we've tried to eliminate issues that people, that we know people had. So if you're gonna build one of these boards, I strongly recommend that you install the parts in the order that you see in the sheet there that Andy is showing us. Um, it'll be easier if you do it that way. Uh, it, it's really frustrating when you've got to get a soldering iron down in there and there's a big hunk of plastic <laughs> that shouldn't be on the board yet, but it is, and it melts if you get the iron on it. Yeah, absolutely, uh, to Bud's point. And, and those are things that, once again, coming in from a novice, um, I was able to look at his list. I was able to kind of understand that that's what uh, the goal was. Um, and, the, and the fallback is always use a really uh, thick piece of soft foam. That's a little, little trick of the trade that I learned out pretty early. But uh, the, the building of the boards, uh, once again, it proves to be very successful. Um, and it makes for a nice, good unit. He's put a lot of time and energy into it. Um, there's just a quick uh, example of what a couple of the boards look like. Um, these are two, uh, two packages, two, two kits. Uh, that have been deployed into our different sites. Um, I don't know specifically which ones, but these very easily could be um, the Western, uh, Western Washington uh, College and or the Bellingham Technical College machines uh, as they are today. So any questions, Peter, so far about these boards? Have you had a chance to uh, play around with them or even build one? Sure, I have one of the, these boards, one of this project that uh, Bud handed off to me when he had an extra one that uh, was pre-built. I look forward to building one of my own one of these days, but uh, I, I have it online all of the time here uh, and uh, I am very, very impressed. Look forward to uh, further advancements in it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they're they're fun, fun tool and, and there's uh, lots of different ways to deploy them. So that's just one image. Uh, here's another shot. Uh, there's Ed in the background, A7QD, and then, then Bryce, N7BTS, and we were at a, a meeting and we were working on some of these boards and something uh, that was valuable to note is our, our local uh, radio digital group um, was able to uh, uh, see the value of these boards and some of the work that we were doing the, uh, the county and, and they actually donated uh, two of them to the project. So I say thank you to the Whatcom County Digital Group for that. So these were, these were, two of these were the ones that were donated. So that was very helpful. Okay, once the boards are built, um, this is just a glimpse of what it kind of looks like to start rolling the components into one of the racks at the uh, remote site stations. Um, so what you'll see is I use a standard, uh, um, I think that's a 1U, I shouldn't say I think. <laughs> that is a 1U rack uh, by 19. So we've, been, we've moved from the 14s to the 19 inch, the deeper racks, and I can kind of explain why in another one of the pictures. Um, but for our rack solutions, we try to use, do it on a single rack application. Um, that way we use as little space. Sometimes these machines are installed in, uh, in rack systems that have already limited space available. So we try to keep it in the smallest form factor possible. Uh, what you'll see is the power supply there on the left. 
Uh, in most of our deployments, uh, we always kind of gravitate to the Kenwood TMV71, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, I like to put the Pi just up there in the right-hand corner. Um, I'll leave a little fuse panel down there on the bottom right. We start building and putting things together. That's what it looks like in its early stages. Um, this is another one we built. This is kind of one of our Rev1 racks. Um, it was This was a 2U rack in this particular application. Um, this one did not have some of the features uh, that we rolled into later on down the line. Um, this one, you cannot uh, change the frequency off-site. This is an Alinko DR135, um, and it's just a very, very simple uh, deployment. Uh, so in this application, it would have been an RMS uh, Winlink node by itself. It would have not had any, uh, any other flexibility or capabilities. And we'll talk about what the other machines uh, can do, and that's why we made the jump to the next level. Um, this is one of our one of our early early Rev One machines, uh, Rev One boards um, setups racks, I should say. And uh, we we had a couple of things that uh, were giving us a little grief. Uh, we learned we had a lot of good lessons learned. So this one got tore apart and it got rebuilt. So this I thought was just kind of a fun picture to see all the components dismantled from the rack and uh, they were kind of in a pile before it got rebuilt. As it was getting rebuilt, this is its new input imp implementation. You'll see there will be the space there on the left-hand side. Um, that's where that uh, power supply would go. Um, that TMV71, I always like to get that right front row and center. Um, there's a couple little holes in that acrylic. We have those uh, acrylic face plates uh, laser cut uh, to match the project. So it works out pretty good. We'll show you a picture of what the front of that looks like. Raspberry Pi with the uh, DRX board and the sound card there on the uh, right hand side. Um, but one of the tools that I think makes this uh, whole project very successful, and it's the bottom center, that's that uh, red board, um, allows us to really take control as a user or an operator and power cycle either the radio or the Pi if, if something hangs. So I think from a um, just uh, a good Samaritan standpoint, um, that was a, a really great addition. And um, Steve, if you want to talk a little bit about that board, I know you were a key a key person in making that work and successful. Yes, it's a very simple uh, design. It has an Ethernet port on it and two uh, relays, um, and the it has a very simple operating system, probably a, a, a very slimmed down version of Linux on it. And you can configure it to work with a cloud server. And that's what we've done. I've set up a server on uh, Amazon Web Services. And it's in constant communication with that server. And then a user can go to the web interface also on that same um, cloud server and be presented with a web interface that allows you to toggle uh, on or off either or both of those relays remotely. So it's very handy for, uh, you know, taking the radio or the Pi offline and then back online again. Yeah, absolutely. And we, as things continue to evolve, um, even though we have not had that I am aware of any type of immediate failure that required us to, to log in to kill that, if there was a spur of submission of some sort or another, I think having that device uh, built into this, this rack has really given us a lot of peace of mind and, and allowed us that extra control uh, due to the fact that these are remote stations. Uh, but Yeah, I got a question for Steve on this. Um, uh, uh, for the listener's benefit, Steve has uh, had us uh, add a, a push button to the uh, the Nexus DRX board that will do a graceful shutdown or a graceful reboot of the Raspberry Pi. So we're not in a position of just yanking the power out from under the Raspberry Pi, running the risk that it could be writing a file uh, when the power gets pulled. With this red board that you've got here connected to the cloud, Steve, in the future, would it be possible for us to send a signal, we could run a line from that com that red controller back to the uh, the DRX, so that remotely you could do a graceful uh, power down. Power down is that something we could do in the future? I think that is possible. However, there are only two relays on this particular board, and one is dedicated to the radio 
power and one is dedicated to the Raspberry Pi power. So the original intent was to control the power to those devices. But they do make relay boards with more than two relays. So um, you could certainly get one with, uh, I think the next step up is four relays and do exactly what you're talking about, but it would be very simple to do that. Yeah. But you, you guys aren't too concerned then uh, about just yanking the power uh, on the Raspberry Pi in order to reset it. Uh, so far, so good, is it? Well, that's a good point. Um, I've set up the HamPi image so that most of the vast majority of the disk writes happen to a, a RAM disk. They don't actually get written to the SD card. So that reduces the possibility of corruption. And the second thing I want to add is that the relay board there in the lower right would only be used to remove the power from the Pi in in dire straits. If 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 it, as you uh, you know, you can imagine a scenario where you can't remotely reboot the Pi, and you just can't access it in any other way. Uh, the the only the only recourse you have is to power cycle it. So that was the intention with the relay board uh, that you see here. Correct. Correct. Yeah, no, and, they, and those are great questions, absolutely, right? But yeah, for the most part, the pies have been very solid. Um, we haven't had any issues, um, and but there has been a few times uh, we've we've accessed that uh, that feature, and it and it's it's proved to be uh, handy for troubleshooting. So um, as the boards start to get done, this is one rendition of what it could look like. You'll see that relay board. Uh, I I built them in just different layouts, um, but it's in the very bottom right. And then what it does is those. Uh, a, one of the relays on that board creates the controls the solenoid or not solenoid the the bigger relay which uh, powers down the radio and due to the Pi not being very power hungry um, the relay board actually powers down the the Pi directly uh, the second relay that you see there on the left um, is actually connected to the uh, rocker switch on the front panel and that kills the whole panel um, so if you came up and something was going on and you just wanted to shut the whole panel down you throw this top switch it would pop one of them, pop that relay, and then the whole board would shut down. And like I said, the second one is controlled by the board, which shuts down the radio because it's got a higher amp draw. So that's a configuration. I have moved to a little bit uh, nicer uh, fuse panel board, but for the most part, that's what the uh, uh, the Rev2 kind of racks have been looking like. Um, in our most recent kind of what we want to call a Rev Rev2 or Rev B rack, I guess if you will. Um, what we found is, is it was more valuable to move this HDMI USB uh, port and the acrylic faceplate um, from the old location, which was um, here on this side, uh, which was very kind of weak in the acrylic, to what we do is we moved it over to the other side and it was in the center acrylic and it was more better supported and it had a better representation on the front. Um, this uh, port allows the user um, if they're doing service work or kind of any um, checking up on the Pi, you can show up. If you have a little portable monitor, you can plug directly in, plug a little USB uh, dongle for a mouse and a keyboard, and you can operate the machine right there directly if there was something wrong. So that was a little change we made down the line. So, all right, so let's start jumping into the what the digital machines are, which ones they are, and where they are. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is W7JIM. Um, this machine is located in Ferndale, up on top of uh, up on top of the hill, uh, the Church Road site we call it, and it's actually in the Ferndale Fire Department. Um, so it's in the second story, up in their storage room. So this site is unique to some of the others because um, it actually uh, lives with uh, the repeater. So if you were to look on APRS.fi or APRS Direct, uh, what you would see is if you typed in, we use a, a tactical call on this site, and it is uh, set up as church. This machine operates 24-7 uh, primarily as an APRS uh, uh, iGate and Digipeter, and it performs quite well in the county. This is a glimpse of what it looks like. Uh, once we log into the remote, uh, that machine remotely, uh, we, can, we can do this with two different services. We can use either VNC Connect, uh, which we found works very well, or a secondary uh, solution that we've been using more recently um, which is DW services, and that's been uh, it's been a good solution as well, and it and it yields us some other uh, successes that uh, uh, VNC does not. 
Uh, Steve, do you want to share anything about kind of the ins and outs of remote access to these machines? Sure, yeah, uh, VNC um, works well. It comes uh, load, already loaded on the standard Raspbian image for the Raspberry Pi. And uh, the real VNC Corporation gives you um, an, a free account that allows you to have five hosts and to share uh, those five hosts with up to two other users. Uh, but the number of uh, Raspberry Pis that we've deployed, we rapidly ran up against that five host limit so we recently started using a, a service called DW Service at uh, dwservice.net, which is an open source solution. And, and uh, you can use a web browser to access the remote desktop of Raspberry Pis, as well as other computers. And we find that works uh, very well. Yeah, absolutely. And we've, had, we've already had some really good success stories uh, in short periods of time uh, in our weekly, or week, weekly uh, Sunday night uh, digital net. So that's been very successful. Uh, but this is what it looks like, just a snapshot of uh, inside that computer. Um, and you can see it's currently running as a uh, digi Eidgate. So that's what it looks like. Um, the, in the early days when we first built that machine, the one, uh, there's a picture I showed you before of the machine that was tore apart. This was what its first rendition was. Um, this is when the DRX board was, was in its early infancy. It hadn't, uh, Bud hadn't done the great work that he's done today yet. So initially this machine was built with a signal link. Um, and as Bud's uh, project evolved and things grew and got stronger, that's why we took this initial machine apart, uh, rebuilt it, and it is now a DRX uh, capable machine. But this is what it looked like uh, when it first uh, got put together. Um, once it's, you get on site, uh, this is the uh, installation at that site. What you'll see there on the top is that's uh, actually one of Whatcom County's um, uh, Brandmeister repeaters, so it works very well. But most importantly, down below it, you'll see our analog, the Whatcom County's analog uh, repeater, and uh, right above it is the digital and remote access digital machine. So this machine was a little unique in the sense that it does not have a power supply on it. Uh, we were able to utilize the, uh, the power supply that was already in sight uh, there in that rack station. You zoom in a little bit closer, right, there's, uh, there's an install. So what you'll see is we'll show some other images um, but we found uh, laser cutting the acrylic ended up being a nice, clean, uh, professional look and install for these uh, machines, uh, even though they don't have this same uh, configuration today. So that was a little look and glimpse at our uh, uh, church site. Um, and one thing that's important to note about this machine is its primary role, uh, IDLE, um, is APRS and uh, Digi iGate. Um, but we can log into it at any point in time, shut that APRS functionality down, and do uh, FL Digi operations out of it. So where we do uh, FSQ and uh, MT63 along, other, along with other modes as well. So it proves to be a great, a great asset. The next one we're going to talk about is W7WWU. Uh, and this is our Western Washington digital machine. Uh, this is one that I was excited about very early on. I wanted to try to get a partnership built. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to kind of get things lined up, but it proved to be very successful. And to, in today's environment, uh, it is a very strong uh, machine for a lot of different reasons. Um, but in the application uh, that we use for this one today, um, we use this one primarily as an APRS iGate on a 24-7 um, kind of basis. And then as needed, we can shut that iGate down um, for APRS and we can do FL Digi operations as well. Um, one thing important to note is the W7JIM machine is primarily operated by KI7KUR. Uh, he's one of our local hams in our radio group. And this one's primarily operated by N7BTS. What we like to do um, is we like to try to spread the workload around and have somebody kind of be uh, an owner, if you will, of that machine and, and take responsibility of operating it. Um, we, we all know there could be that one instance, and I hate to say this, uh, hey, we, all, we all stand a chance of getting hit by a bus tomorrow. So. Um, having, having different people spread out and being the go-to primaries for these machines in an event uh, is important. And it keeps, uh, keeps that knowledge base up as well. Um, so if you look at the Whatcom County map, under the APRS.FI configuration, you will see um, that it pres presented uh, just as that. And this machine as well, we use a tactical call. We just go straight with WWU. Um, and it is, uh, like I said, operates as an IGA. You can uh, log into APRS.FI or direct it anytime and you always see there on the map and 
most importantly, you can see the traffic volumes that it handles and it performs quite well. Once we log into that machine, this is a, a glimpse of, of what you'll see. This is kind of the background. Um, and then the, uh, the, the window that you see open there is the APRS.FI or the APRS iGate traffic as it's coming in. And, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, that's, uh, a lot of that's handled by AX25? Yeah, it uses uh, direwolf, direwolf. Uh, TNC. Yep. Yeah, right. And then there's uh, direwolf configured as an APS, APRS iGate. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So it ends up being a, a great tool. Um, and, again, and that's one of the things we felt is important is even though a lot of these machines are very accessible for FL Digi, we want them to have a backup role so they're able to do things on a 24-7 basis and then we can roll them over uh, to those FL Digi, the digital operations uh, when needed. Do you have a question, hey, Glenn? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we should hear from Peter. Uh, both Peter and I are um, uh, alumni from uh, Western Washington uh, University as well. Western Washington State College when we were there. Um, what, what do you see of this picture? Do you recognize any of it, Peter? Oh yeah, I recognize a lot of it. Recognize a lot of uh, uh, what used to be green space is filled up with buildings now, but uh, it's a beautiful campus. I keep on uh, enjoying going back every time. I was involved in a ham radio operation there at the time uh, when I was there and we uh, uh, associated students uh, bought us a SWAN 500 transceiver and uh, we had a um, an HT 18 high tower antenna and we were up on uh, hill just above the main part of the campus there up toward the dorms. Yeah and now we're putting digital stuff on there. Okay Andy sorry for the sidestep to nostalgia land there. No not a problem at all not a problem at all and that's the the whole thing is we love being able to, to partner partner up with these facilities. And, and I think it, it allows a lot of different people. One, these are great sites. Two, people have uh, common uh, histories uh, with these sites and a lot of interests. And, and this one is, is really, it felt good to, to be able to, to build this and grow it and get this online. So in this picture, um, just as a reference, what you'll see is down here in the, in the, just on the edge of the shot on this main building, is where the two antennas are. And I'll show you a picture of uh, what it looks like, but that's actually on the ground floor is where that uh, station is located. And it has an incredible view to the north of the Bellingham area. So it's a very strong machine. So in uh, one of the offices where the, uh, the antennas for this particular site were already mounted, uh, at one point in time, they already had uh, um, a great group of hams, uh, saw the need to install some antennas, run some coax and I think they had uh, a group at one point in time. The radios and the components had left, uh, but the coax was still there and, and kind of plumbed out through the wall through a conduit. And that's what we became aware of. And that was what we worked to towards to try to uh, utilize. So what you'll see is this is actually one of our simpler installations. You'll see a standard uh, 6U rack mount system uh, in a nice uh, professional looking box. We want to try to keep all of our stations as clean as possible. And then we were able just to connect right into that, uh, into that coax. Uh, we try to label all of our machines with contact information in the event that there's some type of issue. Um, so you'll see right there. And then that's a look of uh, what it is with it all kind of operating as such. We got our contact information. When you open up the box, uh, this is what you'll see on the modern machines. Uh, in today's application, you'll see that Kenwood TMB71. Why those are so important for this project is even though they aren't um, historically a rig control machine out of the box, that something that's advertised, um, they do uh, they do allow a rig control capability with the use of uh, the Raspberry Pi. So through some great work with Steve, we were, he was able to do some work, and I'll let him talk about that. Um, but it allows us to take control of that TMV seventy one and in and in a very kind of simplistic ways to just do the bare minimum. And, and one of the key things is changing frequency, which allows us to, to utilize it in a 24 seven for APRS, but also move to our digital frequencies to have, uh, uh, be, have the radio be able to do multiple things. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk about that program? 
Yeah, uh, the uh, rig control capabilities of the Kenwood are implemented on the Raspberry Pi or accessed from the Raspberry Pi using the uh, Hamlib package, which provides uh, an application called rig control. And uh, I wrote a shell script that interfaces with the rig control. So when, if you have remote access to the Raspberry Pi, you can open a terminal and change frequencies, change power levels, and um, you know access memory locations uh, and a variety of ever other things uh, to manipulate uh, you know how the radio operates. So that's how we uh, we access the radios remotely, change frequencies and modes, and um, it it works pretty well. And we have this deployed wherever we have a, a Kenwood seventy one A. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and it, it ends up, it took the, the first initial install where we couldn't change frequencies. And as the, the DRX board's abilities grew, we learned the things that it could do uh, and continually growing, um, it allowed us to follow that growth. And so now having the ability to change frequency remotely really took these stations to the next level. Uh, so like we talked about earlier, there was the bigger relay for the on and off switch. And I know it's blaringly bright in this picture. Um, that's that blue light on the side, so we can just kill the whole rack all together. Uh, right next to it here to the right is a uh, RJ45. So that's a breakout from the Kenwood TM V71. So if there is some type of uh, emergency event, MCOM related, whatever the case may be, um, you could operate this station with voice as well. We could dispatch somebody to this location um, as a control operator uh, to this machine. Of course, the TMV71 itself. And then underneath this little cap, is a HDMI and USB breakout. Um, and that's where I'm able to plug in a remote monitor and a little dongle to uh, log into the Raspberry Pi to do service work. Uh, we so, use a little small eight port switch on the bottom to handle the networking and uh, just a real simple switch and a little UPS in the back to help uh, manage any power surges uh, as they uh, may become, uh, as they may happen if, if they did. Most of our sites we try to, where we can try to utilize uh, uh, backup power, 24-7 backup power, if it's available. Um, and I do not know their power setup here. Andy, a question for you. Okay. That RJ45 jack that you pointed out just to the left of the radio there, that, just to be clear, that's for plugging in a microphone so you that can operate correct. voice? Yep, okay. Yep. So you don't see it in this picture. Um, but yeah, I typically like to try to leave a mic, a mic at the station. I leave it unplugged um, so that way there's somebody doesn't get into it and say, hey, what's this, and start keying up by accident. Um, but I make it available if there's some type of event, it could become a voice access station. Okay. Yeah, good question. Uh, these are the antennas uh, that were already installed at the site. We felt very lucky to have access to these. Um, one of them set up in the uh, VHF uh, handband and the other ones in uh, VHF and the commercial bands. Um, I didn't have a lot of history with these antennas. I didn't know uh, their performance level. Um, once we got the radio online and used it, we immediately, immediately got some uh, solid success stories. And I, I become aware of the history of these antennas. They perform quite well. So we felt lucky to have access to them. Yeah, Peter, um, you and I are going to recognize these antennas as these are AEA isopoles, right? And these are the antennas that we were using in our original uh, Digipeters clear back in, was it the 1980s? Yeah, sure was. Uh, yeah, AEA isopoles, uh, one of our partners in crime for the uh, Digipeters and so forth years ago was uh, John Gates and 7BTI with uh, AEA. And uh, the antennas were uh, designed by UW professor uh, uh, Dr. Reynolds, who uh, did the design for AEA and uh, had the patent and so forth, and they manufactured them in Linwood. Yeah, so either way, I, I didn't know the history, um, but was extremely impressed of the, uh, the performance rapidly. Um, I know as an eye gate, it really, it's not, uh, it's not really leaned on heavily, um, but when we roll this machine over to FL Digi and transmit for FSQ or MT63 or one of our digital modes, it, it performs very, very well. So it's, it's been a great uh, success that way. That's a glimpse of the Western machine and how it operates today. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is KB7TEC. Uh, and this is the station that we got uh, mounted up at the Bellingham Technical College, and it's their digital machine. Uh, the primary role for this machine is a little different than the other two we just talked about. 
Um, this one's a, what it does on a 24-7 basis primarily is, is as a Winlink RMS node. What we saw is we did have uh, a node or two that were near the Bellingham area, but there were still a lot of shadows. We found that's where it seemed like the larger uh, amount of our user base was. So we wanted to do everything we could to try to strengthen that environment uh, in, an, in some type of MCOM uh, instance. So that's why we targeted uh, this location. Uh, that said, we do through the HamPy image, it does give us some incredible ability. Um, under limited uh, periods, we can shut the Winlink node down. We can perform uh, digital um, FL Digi communications and then fire the Winlink node back up as well. Uh, this one uh, today in today's environment is operated by myself, KF7VOL, and uh, the trustee of the site is KI7IIV, and we're, we're going to be working with Leslie Moore, and uh, she's going to be taking on more of a role. Um, this one is located, I, Winlink always shows the stations a little off, uh, that's their general nature, but it is actually located there at the Bellingham Technical College, which is just kind of north of the Bellingham downtown area. Uh, once you log into this machine, that this is a glimpse of what it looks like. Um, what you'll see in the in the text box is uh, a visual representation of what's going on in the background with RMS Express. Um, for me, this this station, when it, it it's designed to auto boot and on power up, it boot, boots up all these components uh, and these systems in the background, and it runs uh, as a user not having a vast uh, knowledge or base. In, in how this stuff works, I thought it'd be uh, important to be able to visually see kind of what the node was doing and the traffic it was handling. So Steve made some adjustments and, and came this, uh, this log viewer window. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, Steve. Uh, sure. Yeah, the um, uh, RMS gateway and and relate and AX25 uh, applications run as as daemons on Linux. They run in the background, and normally there's no visibility as to what's going on. Uh, other than to uh, manually view the log files. So this is just a, 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 um, uh, a script I wrote that uh, brings up a window and monitors certain log files that uh, the AX25 and RMS Gateway um, programs write to and monitors them in real time. There's also a button there at the bottom uh, start stop RMS gateway. So if you press that button, another dialog comes up and gives you the opportunity to either start or stop the RMS gateway uh, in case you want to operate uh, FL Digi or, or some other uh, application instead of running the gateway. Absolutely. And, and for me personally, as a user uh, of these machines, this was huge. Um, it allows me to be able to pop in at any given time, um, kind of look over the shoulder of the machine, if you will, uh, see what the traffic it's handling. I could go ahead and send a WinLink uh, message to this machine. I could review how that message was received and, like to your point, uh, shut it down to do emergency digital operation as well. So it proved to be very, very valuable. And another thing that makes that successful is having that access uh, to that D7 uh, 7100 to change frequencies for those different uh, uh, process. So once we get uh, at the site, this is what the installation looked like there at the technical college. Um, a lot of times on these installations, we end up in utility rooms. Um, that the, the joy of that is that's where it's close to uh, the internet, the network, um, and it's power and it's, uh, it's low rent space. <laughs> they said, sure, you can put it over here. So uh, in the instance of Bellingham Technical College, this ended up being the location they liked. Um, so we went ahead and uh, mounted it right there to the wall. So that's a, a look of the rack uh, already fastened to the wall. Uh, they did the installation of the box themselves. Um, and they just let me know uh, when it was done. And then I was able to come by and, uh, and mount the components inside of it and run the rest of the, the cable. Uh, it's a little bit closer view, right, to the box. Uh, and it's set up in a very similar way as the others, right? Um, this is the one that I showed earlier that has the... Um, HDMI and USB port on that far side. Uh, I since have moved it and I put it on the other side in between the radio and it's proven to be a little bit more robust uh, of an install location. Uh, we're still running the UPS, uh, the network switch, and it's this one still has all the other functionality with that uh, little uh, board that allows us to remotely power cycle the radio. So very, very similar, uh, if not identical application as Western. 
Um, this one, I was able to take a few more pictures. This is down uh, by where the, the cabling goes through the ceiling. Um, so we ran down across the, uh, there were some cable runs. We were able to drop down in the back and bring it over to where the, the rack was. This is, was before the rack was installed. So this shows kind of what we were working with uh, in the room. Uh, you'll see where the cabling comes over. Uh, we actually coiled up some of it and we go through the ceiling in a port. And I'll show you what that next picture looks like. Right here is a little bit of a hole, and that's where we brought them over, and the wires went up through that hole, and it went into a, a stanchion for some surveillance cameras. On the rooftop side of things, we came up, that uh, hole actually brought us inside of that uh, piece of uh, structure, and then we were able to mount our antenna system to that. They already had this little electrical box uh, cover plate. We mounted a little uh, pass-through and put a nice little drip loop in it and ran up. This was a bracket the college actually have that we utilized and put a nice uh, medium gain uh, uh, base antenna on it. Uh, performs quite well. Uh, this station in uh, an RMS uh, configuration watching the traffic today, um, it handles traffic from uh, the uh, northern Surrey area, uh, Linden, Everson, um, down south, and, and there's a fair amount of traffic it handles out in the San Juan Islands, primarily Lopez. So this is one of our more uh, busy uh, machines. The RF it works quite well. It's got good uh, good range. There's just a glimpse of what the antenna install is, um, and you could this actually is looking to the north. Uh, there's a another shot from the parking lot looking up at what that stanchion was. Um, that the antenna wasn't currently mounted on it, but that's that's where it is from the building level, from the ground level. And this is actually one of their northern uh, northern buildings on the site is the metal shop. So the next one we're going to talk about is K7SFV. So this is the Acme Fire Digital Station. And this is one that was important to me. I knew it wasn't going to get a tremendous amount of traffic. Uh, but at the same time, there was no real wind link support down the I-90 or the Highway 9 corridor. So I felt it was important to, uh, to, to generate this, get this machine uh, put together and built and service any customers or, or anybody that may be in need in that area. Um, the primary role for this one is WinLink uh, RMS node, and it does not uh, have a secondary task today. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Uh, does that area where that is, the unique area, already have coverage for um, APRS? It, it does, actually, and that was something that I looked at. I would like to upgrade uh, this device. Um, this one's built a little bit differently than some of the others, and we'll talk about it. Um, but it... it uh, so Lenny and I, WA7LA, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. WA7LA, I think? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Lenny has an eye gate on the South Lake Wacom area, and his eye gate performs very, very well. And geographically, if you look at the location of Lenny's uh, machine uh, in, in relationship to Acme, um, they're actually very close. Um, and he hand, would handle the majority of that traffic that I'd be handling as well. So we'd be fighting over managing the same thing. Uh, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, the joy is with eye gates. Um, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, but uh, currently, the way this machine is built, we don't have the capability to change frequency, and I'll show you why. Uh, this one is most importantly operated by K7QPL. Uh, he is on the volunteer fire department. And uh, he was one of the key people that was involved in helping get this, uh, making this a success. So if you'll see down here on the map, K7SFV, um, that's where that station is located. And if you look and you follow my cursor there in Sudden Valley in this general area is uh, where Lenny's uh, eye gate is. So it, it really does handle any of that traffic that comes through there. It performs very well. So once you log into that machine in a similar way to we log into the others, either through VNC or, or DW service, uh, this is what you'll see in that one. Um, you see WinLink uh, RMS uh, node running here off to the side uh, and just a very simple uh, representation. When you first get a uh, Nexus DRX board, you put it together uh, and you get the HamPi uh, image. Uh, this is the background that comes with it and they do a good job on it. Um, and then you're actually able to label the background as well and get your call sign in there. So it's, they did it, it made it kind of fun. Uh, this is the very humble fire station there in Acme. Um, it's, uh, it, what's, what's good about this station is it's right smack dab in the middle. It's right on Highway 9, and it sees all the way down to Cedra Woolley and all the way up to Deming. So it's, uh, as much as it may not get a lot of traffic geographically 
to to close that gap and it was the best location to do it in this application there was uh, space was a little bit more limited um, so we found ourselves once again back in a little utility room storage room which is okay um, these boxes uh, fit well in many different uh, applications uh, we did not have power for this box so what we were able to do is uh, with the help of Doug K7 QPL uh, we ran some power and we, we put that box uh, that that power outlet box right below the uh, cabinet we could see in this picture here we ran our cable runs over we were able to push them through a pass-through um, what was a little bit unfortunate about it, but the fire chief was very receptive to, is the box was actually on the complete opposite corner of where the internet was. So uh, to get access to the machine and to allow RMS uh, to work and function as needed, we had to do a lot of cable run uh, in the attic and uh, bring the coax over. Just another shot of the box just over the doorway, the power there, and the inside before the, uh, the rack was mounted. Um, that one is after we got the rack in there. Let's see if I have another picture. I don't. So what's important to note on this in this shot is we did a little bit different uh, install on this particular site. Um, we used a, a Linko, a DR135. Now that proved to be a very, very strong digital radio. I've got a few of those and they work very well. Uh, the downside was is it does not allow rig control capabilities. Um, these projects uh, are not uh, publicly or, or uh, funded in any way other than, than myself. So I actually ran out of TMV 71s. That's the, that's the short version. Um, and I wasn't sure that there'd be a big need for, I had to be able to roll this one over to do FL Digi in today's environment yet. Uh, so I went ahead and I installed it and the, and it, the configuration it has here today. It has, still has all the same capabilities um, if, if somebody was there on site and changed frequency, we could still do everything that the other machines do as well. I'm just not able to do it off. I'm not able to change frequency off site. Uh, this is just a couple images of, of us running the cabling. Um, the room where this machine is, is on the other side of this wall. So we had to bore a hole and we had to chase this existing cable run across the ceiling, uh, over into the corner. Uh, the fire engines are kind of behind me in the classroom. And we just kind of followed it with some uh, original cabling. It came down this side. We ran all the way down through this uh, seam roof line or hallway down below. And I was I was a little concerned about this. I thought I might have to bore a wall into the fire chief's office, uh, but I got real lucky. There was already a hole there. Uh, we were able to pass that cabling through. Uh, ran it up there, and then there was their network device. So that's kind of a glimpse of what that install looked like. Um, I always kind of when I, we, we start to partner with a facility, I always get a little concerned about, um, hey, we'd like to drill holes in your wall in your facility for this thing. And I was followed by, for what? <laughs> so uh, consequently, the, the fire chief at the Acme station was, was uh, great about it. Um, he loved the project, he loved what we were doing. So he was very, very accommodating. So it was very uh, beneficial. Uh, outside, we tried a little bit different uh, antenna application. We used some Unistrut, and uh, we actually tried something new. We that's a Ed Fong a dual band um, in the the low pressure PVC pipe, and we had uh, we got it mounted up into that uh, little piece of uh, conduit there, and used that Unistrut. And wasn't quite sure how it all was going to work, uh, but after it was done, found out that it made for a very very clean install. Uh, it performs well and supports that area good. So uh, it was a great budget-minded uh, uh, solution. One of the things that was a concern, oh, go ahead, Peter, yeah. Uh, if, if a community group outside of your area wanted to duplicate these and uh, start putting them around to various places in their counties or whatever, do you have a ballpark price as to what it would cost per Per system to uh, to duplicate the ones with the V71 and be uh, from nothing to totally operational. Yeah, that's a great question. I should have uh, I should have done my homework on that one and had that ready. Um, I think first and foremost, every site's a little different, right? So you can get lucky, like in our Western application, and they already had antennas and coax cable runs ran, even though that was a longer run. It was 
it was already available. Or you could have other sites that uh, where you got to run everything, right? You got to run 100 feet of network wire. You got to run another 50 feet of uh, coax. You have no antenna solution, so you have to add that. Um, to be safe, I think I have built these for probably as 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 little uh, as five hundred dollars for a complete station uh, turnkey. Um, but that's a lot of sourcing, a lot of uh, used parts. Um, so in the instance of the TMB seventy ones, I, I I purchased those used out of auctions. Uh, so I'm able to save uh, some some dollars there. And then the different places where we pick up the hardware. Um, we'll pick up the hardware on sales and different promotions. Um, I say real world, if, if you just had to build it tomorrow and you wanted to go order all the parts and pieces today and you had to run a little bit longer distance, call it 750. But it's going to be in there. Uh, if you really do your homework, you might be able to get one built for five. But good question. I, I think that it would be great to have a complete documented shopping list or parts list or whatever, for, including the box, the radio, the... Uh, uh, the everything, the full recipe to be able to distribute because I could see some places probably could get grant money or whatever to duplicate this great project. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that would be something as as interest grows. I know for me, a lot of this has been uh, uh, a dream and kind of a vision and we're just figuring it out as we go. Um, and it wasn't until just recently that we were able to get the Acme station. I think it's only been on online, not even a month. Um, but yeah, I think that would be uh, valuable is to get something like that put together and I can absolutely work. So that's a glimpse of the antenna uh, solution. One of the big concerns here for this site um, was the, uh, was whether we were going to have any interference with the uh, fire, fire frequency. Um, so to my knowledge, they're operating at about 155, um, anywhere 16 to, to on up. They're in that kind of 1551 uh, window megahertz. And in our normal op application for this particular site, we're 144930. Um, so there was a little, we tried to create as much vertical separation as possible to ensure that we weren't going to have any issues. And so far through all our testing, we've been okay. So that's, that's been a good success story there. So um, all in all, those are the four primary sites that we have today um, up and running. We have a couple others forecasted uh, that are on the horizon. Uh, but under our current environment, uh, that, that's closed a few doors. In some ways, that's opened a few as well. Uh, but we're going to continue to grow, see where the shadows are in our counties, and continue to use these DRX boards to support, our, support the public. If you'd like to see a full unabridged version of this presentation today, uh, pre please look for that on Bud's uh, YouTube channel, uh, WB7FHC, uh, where you can see the full documentation. All right, Micro Hams and, and all the great viewers out there, uh, thank you for uh, sitting in on this and uh, back to you.